Yeah, I was asked to um, to present on the very uh, introduction of good scientific practice. Um, but I said that I would like, of course, um, to directly focus a little bit on um, on the issue of um, what is good in good scientific practice. And um, I do so because I would particularly want to introduce recent recent developments. I mean, with recent, I mean discussions and developments that occurred over the past five to 10 years. Um, and that resulted into a somehow revised understanding of for good scientific practice. Um, and also led to several policies from funders of uh, biomedical research, many journals, um, but also more recently, um, university medical centers in Germany and, and worldwide um, start to implement new policies that address these new parts of how we understand good scientific practice. And my overarching goal is to introduce primarily into this part. Um, what do I mean? It, it is helpful to understand what good scientific practice um, was about and still is about. Um, for more than 20 years, for example, in Germany, um, the term good scientific practice was, I think, much more broadly established after the German Research Foundation um, published for the first time their, um, their guidelines for good scientific practice, first time in 1998. Um, they also called it proposals for safeguarding good scientific practice. I think they did not exist in English language, just in German language. Um, and they highlighted many, many recommendations and several of them you will also hear more about today, uh, as I saw in, in the program for today. Um, standard, typical good scientific practice recommendations are those. Get ethics review, do not manipulate, lie or plagiate, um, document and store appropriately, be fair with authorships. Um, all are important um, recommendations and they have their roots in several challenges that we, um, that we experience in the sciences, not only in biomedical research, of course, but in many sciences. So they all have their rationales for why we have these rules and we still have to learn uh, them, to refine them. Um, but in a certain way, of course, simplified, but in a certain way, you can say all these guidelines address um, how we can avoid bad practices. All good scientific practice recommendations recommend something on how to avoid bad practices in research. And the relatively new debate is about what are recommendations that we maybe even should have that primarily aim to even improve the good practices, because there are, of course, many uh, practices that make our research good in the terms of robust, trustworthy, useful for other scientists, useful for society, and so on. And these practices um, that improve the trustworthiness and the usefulness of our research, um, are we happy with how we apply it currently, or can we even improve this? And shouldn't this also build part of good scientific practice recommendations. So I will uh, introduce this topic, but I can also um, jump at the end uh, of my uh, talk a little bit, because just recently, last year in August, the German Research Foundation um, again revised their policies. And from now on, they at least start, but I would say substantially start to address these new discussions that have been discussed over the past five to 10 years, I would say worldwide. And now they are also built part at least partly <laughs> in the new guidelines. Um, interestingly, and I have to confess, I only uh, realized this when I prepared this talk. Um, first of all, we have now an English language um, version of the German Research Foundation guidelines. And um, it's not about good scientific practice anymore. It is a good research practice. <laughs> so in a certain way, I now introduce uh, you into good research practice recommendations. And uh, here are two examples at the left for what I mean with relatively new um, types of recommendations. For example, the new guideline nine um, highlights the importance of research design and highlight especially how we can 
or that we should seek to, as best as possible, improve the reliability and reproducibility of our results. These guidelines explicitly mention, as an example, um, the blinding of uh, outcome assessment. So all these things have not been addressed in the German good scientific practice guidelines before. This is really something completely new in this regard. Um, and guideline 13 um, is likewise new. There, the guideline said that if you have results from your studies, um, and hopefully these studies were um, well designed, then you should publish them and make them publicly available at least, publicly accessible. Um, one might think that this is, of course, clear. One, one doesn't need a recommendation on this, but I will come back to this later and demonstrate why this is probably useful to have it as a recommendation. It also means that you can, of course, increase the usefulness of your data if you really make them publicly available via, let's say, open access and these things. Mm. So in a certain way, it's, again, something that improves good practices and not only avoid a bad practice. In former guidelines, the issue of results publication was also mentioned, but um, rather in regard on how to deal with authorship and uh, how to deal with um, not manipulation of data. So um, what is the background for these developments and um, the roots? Um, I claimed that there is a discussion going on now since five to ten years um, about what does good in biomedical life sciences um, mean. And I would say one big milestone that initiated a lot of the debate, or at least made it uh, broadly um, and discussed, is a series of papers published in The Lancet uh, in 2014 uh, forward that had the title Increasing Value Reducing Waste in especially biomedical research. And um, there are five papers that more or less all address current challenges um, that address risk of biases in our research, from clinical to preclinical to basic research. And more or less these risk of biases uh, center around two sources of risk of bias, how we design studies and how we finally report the results. Just to give you one example here with regard to the Lancet papers, there is, for example, this paper four that focus on um, challenges in the value and waste of research with regard to the inaccessible research. They give several examples of what they mean with this. And there's also some um, examples that are uh, interesting for us with regard to our current uh, COVID-19 um, situation and SARS situation. For example, they demonstrated that the drug the antivirus drug or seltamivir um, that became relevant, especially during the swine flu um, situation. Of course, we saw a lot of clinical studies on uh, seltamivir, but um, ultimately trials with 60% of patient data were not reported uh, publicly available and full study reports were inaccessible for 29% of all trials. Of course, we don't know whether this highly impacted on how we judge the efficacy, the efficacy and the safety of this drug. There are some studies about this, but um, still controversially discussed. Another example that is much clearer is uh, this example here, already 10 years old now, but uh, interesting because it was a German health technology assessment um, group, the German uh, ICWIC, um, that was asked to investigate the, the efficacy and safety of this uh, antidepressant, uh, revoxetine, um, because based on the results, the German health, uh, uh, health insurance uh, should decide whether they uh, pay for this drug or not. So what this health technology assessment group did is, of course, uh, reviewing all the relevant and available results from clinical studies, and based on these uh, published data, they came up with the positive results on the efficacy and the favorable risk benefit uh, ratio, so to say. But during their search for publications, they also came across of many, many registered trials on this drug that have not been published yet. Conference uh, abstracts that mentioned uh, trials with hundreds of participants, but that were never published in the literature. And then they asked back to the to the, um, to the company, Pfizer, whether they could receive the data because they need to make a, 
an information portfolio for the German statutory health insurance on this uh, issue. And Pfizer um, said, no, all data are published that are relevant for you. And then with some political pressure, um, Pfizer finally released all data. And after they looked at the whole data set, they then found out that the published data overestimated the benefit of revoxetine versus placebo by up to 115% and also underestimated harm. And then this drug was not um, uh, uh, paid anymore um, by the German health statutory uh, insurance. Um, we recently looked into the results publication performance for clinical studies where not um, a private company is the sponsor, the responsible party, but where the university medical center itself is the responsible party. And um, what we did here is that we, we went to clinicaltrials.gov. This is the most established registry for clinical trials. We sampled all trials from all German university medical centers that were completed between 2009 and 13, and then we followed them up for later results publication. Finally, a little bit more than 1,500 trials, and we presented our results not only in a paper, but also in a, in a publicly accessible website um, where you can, um, where you can um, also uh, interact with these data via a shiny app. Um, here's what we found, uh, just on two slides. Um, two years after completion, um, in average, this is this, uh, this yellow uh, orange bar, uh, in average, 40% of all studies published their results from these 1,500 clinical studies. If you give them more time, uh, up to five years uh, after completion, you see, of course, that more published their results, but still, uh, after five years, about one third of all completed clinical trials with thousands of participants uh, did not yet publish their results. So this is the current status quo with regard to um, clinical trial reporting and with regard to the design as another source of bias, um, I can of course not go uh, in depth here, but I just wanted to highlight that there are still discussions and, and papers about challenges that we have with the design, um, with risk of bias, even in late phase clinical trials. For example, here in the BMJ paper, they investigated um, trials supporting approvals of cancer drugs and discuss the different design characteristics characteristics and risk of biases. So all of this was about clinical research, but of course, biomedical research, life sciences is not about clinical research alone. Uh, in contrast, I assume that many of you rather work in, in areas where you are in the preclinical or basic part of biomedical research. And of course, the whole process is a complex uh, endeavor. And the value of research is not only to have finally drugs, but of course, knowledge about disease and disease procedures. However, ultimately, of course, in a certain way, we would say that maybe after years and years, um, results from basic preclinical research, especially from uh, animal research, is uh, primarily legitimized because we think it can ultimately also support us in deciding when we go into clinical research. And against this background, it's important to know that the success rates of all the clinical research um, that is informed via preclinical research is not very good, controversially discussed. Here's one of these, uh, maybe one of the biggest study in, in, in this regard that investigated more than 4,000 drugs and over 7,000 independent clinical development pathways and showed that the overall success rate um, is 10%. 90% fail. 90% um, of potential new drugs that had very promising data from the preclinical field. Right. So the question is, uh, I know, here I can maybe also um, show this, where, where is the challenge? <laughs> it's interesting to see that um, the high failure rate uh, that we have, 90% failure rate, is not primarily um, due with regard to safety. When we go to the clinics for phase one clinical trials, where we test the safety of a drug, we are quite successful, right? Two thirds of drugs entering phase, five, uh, phase one are successful and then enter phase two, meaning in a certain way that the supporting evidence 
from preclinical data on safety is somehow matching our results in the clinical studies. The big challenge then comes in phase two, where we for a first time test the clinical efficacy of a drug. And here you see it's vice versa, right? Two third fail at phase two, despite the fact that we had a lot of promising data from preclinical research demonstrating a potential success in humans as well. Those who made it to phase three then again fail in 40 in 40 percent of cases. So now you, one can of course say this is a pity, um, but I mean, this is just um, reality. Animals are not humans. Um, animal biology is not human biology. It is the best we have, um, but this is what we know. Animal models do not completely um, match with human biology. So maybe 10% success rate is even not that bad. Um, and, um, and animal research, preclinical research, of course, helps to make this number higher uh, as it would be without preclinical and basic research. Now it was, again, almost 10 years ago that especially the pharmaceutical industry started to, to controversially discuss that they are not happy with the 10% and they don't think it is because of, of animal models that do not predict the, the, the results in humans. Um, there were two influential papers, one from representatives of Bayer a Healthcare, published this paper where they wrote believe it or not and with it they mean the academic preclinical research especially uh, animal research um, on potential drug targets and they argue in this paper that they and other pharmaceutical companies more or less do not rely anymore on public data uh, why because they try to reproduce the animal studies in their own labs and we are successful in only 10% of cases. In 90% of their attempts to reproduce data, they failed. Of course, there's a discussion about whether they did good replication studies, but they also continued in their discussion and arguing what they think the reasons are. It's not primarily the animal model. It is the fact that the design of the preclinical studies was insufficient. In the publications that they then reproduced, they often saw no randomization, no blinding, no sample size calculation going on. And second, they fear that maybe there's a big publication bias. They only see positive results of animal studies and very few data exist on negative results. However, all the decision-making on when to enter clinical research is based on the published data, meaning that they maybe often overestimate the effect and then are misled by uh, starting clinical trials. Um, there was a second company, uh, Mgene, that more or less did the same thing. They reported on their failure to reproduce preclinical studies, and they also argue it's probably about the design and the selective reporting of results in the academic field. Then the researchers were asked themselves by by Nature, for example, Nature did a survey across authors and readers and asked uh, more or less, is this true? Do we have a reproducibility crisis, as several stakeholders in the field argue? And the, the vast majority said uh, yes. So the red part of the circle here is yes. 38% uh, said it's a slight crisis. I think it's a funny term, a slight crisis. But uh, most said there's a crisis. 3% said no, no crisis. 7% didn't know. And when they were asked what can be done, nearly 90% said we need more robust experimental design, better statistics, and better mentorship. So with better robust design, more or less, they mean primarily these three practices, good scientific practices that we, in principle, have to address potential biases. Um, we all cannot avoid these biases, but we have measures on how we can at least try to reduce them. The selection bias can be reduced by randomization of animals on whether they are put into the intervention or control group. We can reduce the expectation bias of the investigators by blinding the outcome assessment. And we can reduce the influence of chance by having a proper sample size calculation not underpowered uh, studies with regard to the effect sizes that you um, that you anticipate. So um, 
Of course, people also from the meta research part looked into this uh, uh, issue. What we know so far from published animal studies is that indeed um, most do not report on these uh, issues. Your paper from from McLeod et al. Uh, showed for uh, animal studies published in PubMed that less than 20% report on randomization and very, very few report on blinding and on uh, SSC, that is uh, sample size calculation. Um, now, yeah, they also demonstrated that randomization increases slightly, blinding does not very much increase. But of course, I have to highlight that the most recent data here that they investigated are already 10 years old. So maybe this improved a lot. I don't know about a study that investigated this in 2000 or in, in, in 2019 20 for a, for a broad portfolio. We did some analysis in another project on preclinical studies with regard to genome editing and found a picture that is very similar to the situation that you see here. But this is not really improved in this field, at least. Um, however, you could argue this is publication. So we don't know whether what is reported here or not reported reflects the practice. Maybe all these things were done, but not reported in the paper, maybe because of limited word count or whatever reasons. Um, for this, uh, with regard to this, um, argument, it's interesting to see another study that investigated not publications of animal study, but the initial um, applications and study protocols that were submitted to the authorities here in Switzerland. So this group here had access to all the full sample of experiment applications to the Swiss authorities and demonstrated that this pattern is, is, is similar here. So the reporting of these measures um, is very, very low. But again, this also, as you see, reflects applications from 2008, 2010, and 12. Um, I don't have data on whether this is uh, better now. This was the risk of bias re with regard to result, uh, designing of studies in animal research. My last part of empirical data now is on the part of results reporting. In clinical research, it is, I would say, investigated since 10, maybe 20 years, many, many studies worldwide investigated how many clinical studies are finally published. Um, in the field of animal research, this is something that hasn't been addressed very much. Um, there are some studies such as this one here that indirectly investigates whether there is publication bias in animal research. This was a group that looked at animal stroke studies. And what they did is a systematic review of all published data and then they applied some statistical analysis to predict on whether there are most probably um, several studies um, not published, um, so-called funnel plot. And with regard to their statistical analysis, um, they come to the conclusion that we probably have a major overstatement of efficacy due to a publication bias of primarily positive results in animal stroke studies. What we did recently is a more direct study we work together with two animal research facilities in Germany, in Hanover and in, in Aachen, and um, took a random sample of, um, of animal study protocols that were completed since more than uh, uh, five years, and then followed up these, public, um, uh, these protocols for later uh, publications. So what we found is that per approved animal study, we found at least one publication in, in about two thirds of these um, um, approved animal studies. So one third did not uh, publish the results. Um, of course, what we not investigated, and this was very difficult to investigate, we tried is um, what the publication rate per approved uh, animal is, right? The 67% only reflect whether we found at least one results publication per approved animal study, but those of you who work with animals know that often in the approved animal study, you have several experiments, several groups, um, and many, many uh, animals. So what we need not investigated is this. I say this because just last week, there was another study now from uh, uh, Utrecht, who also did more or less what we did. <laughs> Um, they assessed the publication rate per approved animal study, and they came up with about 60%, so quite close to our results. But they also realized in a certain way to, um, to assess the publication rate 
on the number of approved uh, animals, and here they come up with a with twenty six um, percent publication rate. So this is um, very recent research, and I think this will probably expand, and we will see more research in this regard also in other countries on what is currently going on with results reporting. And of course, we need a discussion about what is maybe a legitimate um, non non publication of results and where are the results maybe that should be disseminated either by by papers or by data sharing in other ways but i will come back to this at the very end so in a certain way what i put together here um signal to an international debate that we have a challenge with robust science we need to improve the way we design studies and report results and of course, this is a multi-stakeholder thing. It is not only about the researcher to be blamed here. It is about funders, journals, and also the institutions who employ the researchers and who set standards and incentives uh, for their career to make this um, um, uh, working better. I already highlighted at the beginning that the DFG changed their good scientific practice guidelines and going more and more in this direction. I also want to highlight that they even did some other policies and position papers that even more explicitly address, for example, the field of uh, animal research. Also last year, they published this, this position paper that aimed to highlight that the review of animal research to receive funding should not only look at the three Rs. I, I will not introduce the three Rs here. I hope that everybody who works with animal research has heard about the three Rs replacement, reduction, refinement in animal research. Um, all these principles are important, but all deal with animal welfare. And um, this DFG position paper here highlights that to make animal research good research, it's also important to highlight the validity and the robustness of the project. And they explicitly mention these things, such as randomization, blinding, sample size calculation. Then um, the second big funder in Germany, the BMBF, German, Ministry for Education and Research published a new funding line that especially funds preclinical research that applies these measures, such as randomization, blinding, sample size calculation, to be then called confirmatory preclinical research. This is maybe a helpful distinction, right? There, there is, of course, a, a, a explorative research going on in basic and preclinical research, and it is important to have explorative research. There are probably good reasons for why some studies in basic and preclinical research do not apply randomization, blinding, sample size calculation. But the closer you come to the preclinical world and to the clinical world, the more and more should we establish confirmatory study designs to make our results more robust. And this is what they fund. We have currently 15 studies funded by this funding scheme and the Quest Center where I'm working is doing an accompanying study on the support and evaluation of this program. And on the journals, several journals, a journal such as Nature, for example, who in a certain way upgraded their policies. If you submit a, a animal study paper to Nature, nowadays you have to be explicit about randomization, blinding, and sample size calculation. It doesn't mean that you have to do it, but you have to explain why you didn't do it and, and have to argue for this. Um, I also want to highlight that there are, of course, a lot of tools that support you in this good scientific practice that are all um, for free. Um, there are tools that, that help you to publish null results. Our Quest Center just recently um, launched the, the Fiddle tool, where we highlight and support on how you can uh, publish null and neutral results with regard to the different new developments that you have in the publication field, right? We have journals such as PLOS One and others who publish null results. Um, we have preprint servers and other uh, innovative um, publication ways. This is for, for the paper type of publication, but of course, making your data and results um, publicly accessible does not always mean that you have to publish something as a paper. If you have several data in your file drawer that you think are not publishable as paper, you can, of course, also share data on all these different data sharing platforms. And I would say that from an ethical, from a good scientific practice point of view, this would count as, as, um, as an uh, effort to make your data uh, publicly accessible 
Um, in the clinical field, we have pre-registration as one tool, so to say, that helps to prevent outcome switching or cherry picking of results. This is increasingly discussed, at least now, for the field of preclinical uh, animal research. Of course, you can pre-register protocols for every type of study at the Open Science Framework and have a timestamp on your protocol. And when you then later submit your paper to a journal, you can say, look, what I present here is timestamped as a protocol, and I explicitly argue what amendments I did. So it's much more transparent in this way. Um, in Germany, the German Center for the Protection of Laboratory uh, Animals, the BF3R, is the first one worldwide an own uh, animal study registry. So you're, it's not mandatory yet to register your uh, animal study, but at least you have um, opportunities to do so if you would like to become, a, let's say, a first mover in this regard. Um, other national centers for uh, animal research, such as those in the UK, provide design assistance that help you to uh, implement sample size calculation, randomization procedures into the design of your studies, um, also for free. And last but not least, if you are about writing your papers, then there are nowadays a lot of reporting guidelines that aim to further improve the usefulness of your paper. It's a good scientific practice to adhere to reporting guidelines because then your papers become more useful for readers, also for those who aim to reviews of the literature. Yeah, so I, um, I come to the end. I showed this picture, and this is a picture from a Nature paper that highlighted also that journals and funders reacted on this uh, issue over the past years. The academic institutions have not been at the forefront, so to say, in new policies in this regard. And this paper argued that also institutions, the academic institutions, must do their part for reproducibility. In a certain way, I would say um, Charité currently has a lot of uh, uh, efforts in this regard. Um, I, um, I cannot uh, explain them uh, all here. But in a certain way, of course, the academic institutions are very relevant for the researchers because whether the adoption of these practices that are introduced pay off career-wise depends on whether the institution that employ you finally, maybe provide you a permanent position as a, a professor, whether these institutions uh, value and incentivize these practices as well. And this is what Charité is starting to do. For example, if you nowadays apply for a professorship at Charité, you have, of course, a lot of files and documents that you have to fill in, and they still ask you for things such as how many publications that you uh, have, what is your uh, impact factor, uh, third party funding secured. So all these also controversially discussed topics, but they have a new file that you cannot skip, where they introduce that the charity attaches great importance to these transparency and uh, reproducibility practices. And they then ask you, how have you been pursuing these goals so far? What are your plans for the future? So I think that even the institutions now jump on and you see that relevant parties that pay off career-wise um, value and incentivize these things. Our Quest Center also is doing a little job in this regard just to trigger this. We have awards that you can apply for when you work for Charité. Um, if you have a pre-registered uh, publication, for preclinical studies, you can apply for this, or I think you more or less directly receive this 1,000 euro quest award and other awards for, for replication studies for open data and so on. So, of course, low, low awards, but um, uh, something that is more uh, kind of a symbol. Yeah, um, I tried what I tried to do. I hope I, I fulfilled some of my goals. Um, here's my summary of the things that I hope is something like my take home message. I, I try to introduce why good scientific practice includes practices to reduce risk of bias, um, which was more or less neglected over the past one, two decades um, of good scientific practice, at least in the guidelines. I presented you a little bit the status quo of the still insufficient implementation of these practices for risk of bias uh, reduction in design and uh, results publication. I presented you some of the how-to tools that support you in implementing these practices. And I try to highlight at least that um, 
adapting these practices, at least think about these practices and their relevance for your own projects might, off, might also pay off career wise because this, uh, the funders, journals and institutions increasingly react, react on this. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention.